Director Wolfgang Peterson is here growing up in Germany in the wake of World War II. He developed a passion for all things American. By the age of 11, he decided that making movies would be his life's ambition. He shot to international fame in 1981 with the underwater thriller Das Boot. Since then, he has helmed such blockbusters as In the Line of Fire, Outbreak, and Air Force One. This past summer, he returned to the water for his biggest hit to date, The Perfect Storm, which has grossed $320 million worldwide. I'm pleased to have him at this table for the very first time. Welcome, sir. It's great to have you here. We have tried hard, as you know. <laughs> tried hard. And you did me a huge... I mean, you... I'm here now. You're here I'm, now, and you've made a special effort to get here, and, so... And I'm very happy to be here. Thank it's you. A, it's an honor. Uh, well, I see the show very often. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, why is it that this movie, I just mentioned $320 million, mm -hmm. uh, so connected with an audience this summer? Mm-hmm. Um, and six people die. And six people die. At the end. At and the still, end. worldwide, people go and see it. Knowing that they die. Knowing that, but most of them. Most of them, right. Not all of them. Right. Most of them, knowing that they die, people talk about it. You know, the book is very well known. Um, I think this is a very universal theme, and it's a basic fear people have to go out and uh, go into an extreme situation, um, like um, weather. Um, especially out the ocean. The ocean, I think, has had always a magic kind of thing about it. Um, what I personally also f always found so fascinating is that going out, I grew up in Germany on the north, right, right at the water, going out with the boats and see, you know, the beauty of the sea, yeah. the colors and everything. It was a magical place where, where, um, where your thoughts can really fly, where yeah. you can build uh, your life in a, in a wonderful way. I always loved that. Yeah. At the same time, though, the weather can go like this and turn around, and you, um, you face the biggest disaster you can imagine. This kind of world of extremes with the water, the whole mythical aspect about the sea, I think always is interesting for people. And then, of course, Fisherman, I think it was interesting to see for a change, that was for me important, for a change to not see your typical Hollywood um, genre film in the sense of we deal here with cops, always FBI, FBI people, or right, you know right, all these right. sort of stock characters from Hollywood, but with um, very simple fishermen. Uh, I think... Uh, but but interesting all. Yeah, but I think an audience related to them, and I think that that was fresh for them to see... And to the women in their people. lives. Yeah, right? I think, yeah. Because we've made them even more human. Yeah, I mean, it was all very, I think it was all very real, uh, real. I mean, we spent a lot of time, if you think about it, the other risky aspect of it was to actually spend about 40 minutes of time in the beginning of the movie to really set up the whole atmosphere. Where are we here? This is Gloucester, Massachusetts. This is uh, a small town. People don't make much money. It's a declining fish industry. Um, it's all about getting your paycheck, and then comes, you know, shall we risk uh, this late trip again out to sea to get fish? Mm. And, um, and they decide to do it, and we understand why they need the money. It's all about money. This is not a sort of heroism yeah. because of, oh, let's climb, glory. climb the mountain or glory and so, and get sort of great stories and magazines because of, and and fame and glory this is just to get your paycheck i find that so fascinating that these people risk their lives every single day and so that we have our swordfish on the planet. well if they didn't need the money they would have been alive today probably oh yeah i mean ten thousand probably you know the number alone in gloucester ten thousand fishermen died in going out to sea catching fish since 1623 Ten thousand in Gloucester. That's one amazing. town. One small town. So in like three and a half centuries. That's amazing. That's, that's amazing. Ten thousand since 1623, when Gloucester was one of the oldest towns in, in the East Coast, and started very early with fishing, and that's where it happened, and uh, it still happens, and will happen all the time. When did you know that you wanted to make? this movie very soon as soon as you read perfect storm yeah 
I had, when I did Air Force One, a sound mixer came to me and said, because of Das Boot, he said, Wolfgang, I just finished this book. Uh, he, he didn't think about the movie. He just said, this book is amazing. You should read it. It's so exciting. It has to do with water, and you love water and sea, and so it's really up your alley. Why should you, know, <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah. you should read that? And I did. And um, uh, it was such a coincidence. While I was reading the book, my partner, Gail Katz, become, became a phone call from Warner Brothers, from Bill Gerber. Right. And he said, Gail, we just bought a book that is just climbing up the bestseller list. And it's a pretty strange and risky book because all people die at the end. But it has to do with water. And you were thinking about this boat. And so can you give that to Wolfgang? He might be interested to, to do that. So it came at the same time. So I finished like this. Yeah, so you read it literally in one setting, or yeah. one or two oh, yeah, settings? Absolutely, huh? absolutely. And I read it, finished it, and so, oh my God, I want to do this. Really, I thought a little bit about it, but two days later, the phone rang again. Yeah. And <laughs> Bill Gerber said, this is very embarrassing, because it's already in Steven Spielberg land. Uh. And somebody here messed it up, and I didn't know about that. And uh, it's, it's a little embarrassing. We gave it to him first, and blah, blah, blah. And um, can you make kind of a little time out here situation? And In other words, can you wait to see if he wants to do it? Yeah. And you said? What can I say? He said, got it first. Sure. He apologized for it. Right, I know right. Stephen uh, very well. Okay. And said, OK. Mm -hmm. So and not only, thank God, a week or so later, a phone call yeah. came again and says he doesn't want to do it. Because no more water, he said. No more water. After Jaws, After no more water. No more water. And so, and then yeah. I started. And I started right away, and we hired a writer, and I couldn't believe that I could make this movie. Yeah. Yeah, is this I all, loved it to do it. Is this all misplaced, though? I mean, did, did you need any experience making a movie about the water to make Perfect Storm well? I mean, I would assume, I think you made this movie because you're a great filmmaker. I don't think you made this movie because you had done Das Boot, do you? No, I mean, Das Boot no, no, is no, really ab about... Absolutely, you're absolutely right. It's only, I mean, was I drawn to the subject matter because it has to do with people yeah. going out to sea? Yeah, of course. Okay. And maybe you have a passion about it and therefore you know more about it. But... Yeah, and also, uh, if I compare the Das Boot with, with uh, Perfect Storm, Das Boot was done like 19 years earlier, yeah. uh, gave me some maybe experience to do how special things, but by far not what I had to do here. So you're absolutely right. And... Um, uh, you cannot just wipe out 19 years of uh, the progress of filmmaking, and that, that's uh, what we did here. Had, in most cases, nothing to do with what we did with Les Paul. Right. It's much more complicated. S screenplay. Who did the screenplay? Screenplay did Bill Whitliffe right. from Texas, who did Lonesome Moreau uh, Dove. Yeah. On, and then Bo Goldman came in and did some dialogue work with me. Some dialogue. Mm -hmm. Casting. Casting. Oh, yeah, I love to talk about that, casting. I think uh, after, you know, a few things, you know, it's, uh, it never works. Right away, you get your cast and off we go. So you have always, um, you know, some uh, go in this direction, that, that direction, and then finally you nail it. And I think we really nailed it. First idea was Nick Cage for yeah. Billy Tyne, for the George Clooney character. Right. Um, didn't work out there. He had to do Gone in 60 Seconds, so there was time situation. <laughs> Which was Gone in 60 Seconds. Well, he, he did that. Uh, I met him, he wanted to do it, then I met Mel Gibson, he was interested to do it, and Patriot. He was so, both? Both. He was have two big summer movies? Yeah, so I thought, well, how do we do that on the 4th of yeah. July, because yeah, we right. came at the same time. Fight yourself. Yeah, so um, that didn't work out, I think there was money involved in, in that decision. And then um, Clooney came. Uh, mean, what do you mean Clooney uh, came? Came. Came sort of into my consciousness. Uh, but because of Out of Sight or because of... Uh, because of Out of Sight, what I loved. Yeah. Yeah, I liked the movie a lot. And uh, no, somebody said, what about Clooney? I hadn't s thought about it. Somebody from inside Warner Bros. What about Clooney? I think it was Lorenzo de Buona Ventura. Said, yeah, right. I said, Clooney? Isn't he a little bit too light out of sight? I love it. Yeah, right, right. Grant. He's more caring. Exactly what I would say. Yeah, and uh, I don't know. I mean... Uh, uh, the age is all right, and also let me see. Then I sneaked into a non-finished um, um, uh, version of his film, uh, the the desert. Uh, what was the title? Three again? Kings. Three Kings. Yeah, with Mark Wahlberg, and saw him there and was really surprised. I said, "Wow, he! I think yeah. he can do that." And I saw also, I got a chance to see Mark Wahlberg yeah. there, and I said, "And I mean, these both together were absolutely great." And then I met uh, George. And George said, um, 
I wanted to play the other guy. You know, I, I, I the Wahlberg character. Yeah, I mean, I was a little. Do you think I'm right for the? <laughs> for the for the part of the captain, and I, because uh, he thought the captain, like you know, you, when you when you read stuff, I always think the captain is maybe like a Sean Connery type yeah, or, or Spencer or, Tracy or yeah, somebody, right. somebody right. a little older. And uh, I said, you know, George, you are maybe already a little old <laughs> for the part. You know, this guy was 37, you're 38, so yeah. now you're absolutely right. Age-wise, it's perfect. So. Uh, then I think he was maybe had a little bit um, hesitation if he can fill the shoes of this big part. He was carrying the movie and carrying the movie, yeah. But then you know I I, I think I convinced him to do it and he did it. And then um, he said also in Mark Wahlberg, you know, if you've seen him, I can really suggest him. And I met him. And then I had my two uh, people. Principal my characters, two guys, wonderful. Yeah. Man, I mean, this was easy for you then. Yeah, it was not difficult. Diane Lane was yeah. great. Also. Yeah, boy, was she great. Oh. Yeah, I mean, she was here. Wow, I, I saw it when she was here. Mm -hmm. uh, das Boot. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Das Boot. Uh, das was like this. Uh, in the early seventies, um, Lothar Günther Buchheim wrote uh, the book Das yeah. uh, Das Boot. It was uh, a big bestseller. Americans bought it because it was uh so huge that the Americans bought it. They want to make a film out of it. Very interesting. Most Americans don't know it. And the first group who came to Munich to do Das Boot was John Sturgis, the director, with Robert Redford as the commander. Yes. I was next door, so to speak, on the same lot, doing my little television films, and with all the envy in the world, I was looking at them doing this wonderful German story, and, uh, and I couldn't do it. And I said, I think I should do this. And um, I couldn't because we were small directors yeah. and small budgets. Next group came in because that fell apart. Yeah, they Redford or whatever just didn't work. It fell apart. They couldn't get the script right. right. They had problems with the writer. The next group came in. And we said, now you would say now. Don Siegel and Paul Newman. Yeah. As the next group came in. Yeah. And they spent another half a year or so in Munich to set this all up and shoot the movie. And I was still pacing. Yeah. Uh, it's still more pacing on the lot, saying, oh my God, why not me, you know, and why Americans? So, make the story short, the various studios collapsed um, in a sense that they changed uh, management and blah, 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 anything that happened, and the Americans went away, and the new manager of the various studios came to me, and he was Günther Rohrbach, who was uh, from the WDR network in Germany, who was the sort of um, supporter of all our young directors, like from Fassbinder to Schlöndorf and everybody, right, 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 myself. Right. He had dinner with me once and said, Wolfgang, the Americans are gone. I'm now the boss of the various studios. Here we have this boat that was already built. Do you want to do it? Yeah. And you went and got Jürgen? And then I got Jürgen, and I was, I mean, I was so happy. I said, I can do it now in German language, not in English. Right. I can get Jürgen and, um, and uh, got him. I had already done like four films with him then, yeah. so he was kind of my De Niro. Like De Niro is for Scorsese, that was Jürgen for me. Yeah. So he was uh, natural for that camp. Roll tape, here's a scene. <laughs> Amazing. It, as you said to me, if we were watching this, pure terror. Yeah, I'm gone and seeing it again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when these, how do you say that these things come out of the wall, it's just terrible. Yeah. Because there's a, there's a precarious time in which if you go one foot m more down, mm -hmm. or one meter more down, the whole thing goes... Yeah, it goes like that. I mean, if you go over the breaking point, boom, yeah. goes together and it's nothing left. It's just flat and, you know, everybody's dead in an instant. In the line of fire. Yeah. Was that your idea? I mean, was it? Did, was that Clint Eastwood's idea to have you direct that? Yes. I'm, I, uh, it was, and thank God he did it. <laughs> um, uh, I got the script from my agent Rand Holston, and he said, "Wolfgang, this is a great, great script, but um, Clint Eastwood is, is um, attached to it as a director, but you should have a look. I read the script. It was probably the best script I've read in my time here in America, and that's 12 years. I've, I found it really, really great, and um, very castable, great, unknown world, Secret Service, something mm -hmm. 
people don't know too much about it. Mm -hmm. A great hero in the sense of an aging man who wants to redeem himself one more time, last chance, these sort of basic themes in films. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Clint Eastwood, you couldn't cast him better, better than that. I said, oh my boy, I want to do that. So, um, and I knew then that he, uh, Clint wanted to see me, and so because he was a great fan of Shattered, my film Shattered, and thus both, and um, we had a great meeting together. And you know, I don't, you, I don't know if you had Clint here in I this do. show. I, I have. He is very matter of fact and said, Wolfgang, yeah, let's do it. What the hell? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like, let me think about it, or yeah, let me sleep, I get back guy, to yeah. you and see, right, you know, right, he right, is right. bottom line. Yeah. He said, let's do it. And, um, and we had a lot of great time. We had but you're directing a guy who you know knows how to direct. Yes. And you're directing a guy who whose reputation is larger than life. Huh? Yes, and it was for me at well. And, I, and who is, whatever character he's playing is also Clint Eastwood. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it was for me coming, I told you I grew up in Germany with the, all these American films, and, and uh, Clint Eastwood was for me, I, I mean, it was just a, an amazing uh, opportunity now to work as a German director, to work with a guy like him. It was just wonderful. And the fact what you said, that he's a director himself, he was such a gentleman. I mean, he would never really come and say, I think you should do it from here, and why don't you do this? And so he never did that. He did his job, and he did it beautifully, and he did it very understated and very, very good. And I think it's one of his best performances, I think. I, he had really nothing to do with the burden of uh, directing a movie. He couldn't really concentrate. So focus on it. Yeah. Couldn't focus on it. He trusted me as a director, I had the feeling, and that helped very much for him to get a great performance out. Let me talk about two other films that leave before Perfect Storm. Uh, Outbreak. Mm -hmm. Because in those two movies, in, in the line of fire, in the line of fire and Outbreak, one of my favorite people in the world is Rene Russo. <laughs> yeah. Me too. You know, I, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. You uh, see, I, I cast her in, so, in two films back to back so you can see how much I like her. Why um, do you like her? I like her because she has three things. First of all, when I met her first, I thought, I can't, cannot believe how beautiful she is. Me too. <laughs> but there are many beautiful girls yeah. out there. Secondly, I was under my desk because she was so funny. Yeah. And I think a combination of a woman that is very beautiful and at the same time has a wonderful sense of humor is rare. Yeah. So you narrow it down already. And then I found out, not right away, but through the course of working with her, that she is an angel. I mean, I always looked around basically to see where are the wings, because she is such a good person. She is such a wonderful, she's very religious. Exactly. I know. She is a wonderful uh, person, uh, takes care of other people. She has a great heart. She is. Um, the whole package, Rene Russo, is just too good to be true. I mean, she's beautiful, she is funny, and she's a great woman, a great human being. Dustin so, Hoffman also. Dustin. I was a little nervous about Dustin because Dustin's reputation you know, was that he's, oh, God, that's a handful, and he's so difficult. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, he asked me for lunch uh, because he said, just a general lunch, and we, I like your work, Wolfgang, let's, can we do something? And I told him about Outbreak, and... Uh, I got a pass from Harrison Ford for Outbreak, and I said, uh, I said, wait a moment. Hmm. Hmm. What about you? I, and really, I had no idea, because it's a little unusual yeah. for kind of an action star. And he said, well, do you think? And so on, give me the script, and so on. And the, so two days later, we ha had him on board. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, and then we got along great. I mean, Dustin is. I think he also realized that there there were some things in the past that that uh, hurt his reputation a little bit, and he got his act together a little bit better. <laughs> yes, and um, we had then a great time. I'm, I'm, a, but I must tell you the following: I have done a lot of movies now, and there's so much about difficult actors. I think they are very. It's very, very rare that there are so-called really bitchy or difficult people and actors on the set. I think if basically the work that's been done okay and right, and people know what they're doing, especially the director knows what he's doing, it's okay. I mean, it's very often actors are insecure, or very often also actors, because they, they, they concentrate on their part in the filmmaking, their role, mm -hmm. are very often more, know more about their part, know more about that aspect of the whole film than maybe the director. That's very dangerous. Mm. So. Um, if you do your homework and you really uh, 
and you, you do, really do do know what you're doing and do a good job in this, I think uh, it it it's not really a problem. I never had. I have only once really in Germany way back, and uh, that the only case where I really had a problem with an actor. Who was that? That was Bruno Ganz, a German oh, actor. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. very well-known right. actor. Right. Right. And uh, but that had different problems. Um, What's important for you now? I mean, to continue to have interesting work, uh, to find films that you really very much want to make? I mean, yeah, I, I told you, um, I'm now in the face. I, I had four films now done in, in, uh, in Hollywood, in America, after coming here from Germany, and they were all four pretty successful, so that's something what's good, um, uh, what, uh, what I like about it. Um, uh, there's more to come, I hope. It's always, uh, I never really look back. It's always, it's another island further on, and the another island further on is definitely where is the even better movie out there, and, uh, and that's what I'm looking for. A, I mean, not a, a, a one movie. I mean, in other words, what you mean? You're always just looking to make a better movie than you made before, and not yeah. as good as the one you. But how many? Yeah. Forever. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot not do movies. I have to do this till I. Fall what down. is it that you love about it? I love to go into a stage, see 150 people there, waiting. What's going on now? It's chaotic. It's very often it is cold or hot or whatever. Nobody can make any sense in the way of what the hell will be here today. And now you go and you have, with these incredible crews you find in America, you have a day so filled with adrenaline and creative e ideas floating around and the actors come and you do a scene and finally maybe in take 17 you got it right and you come home after a day's work like that and you feel so good about yourself. I mean, it's the intensity of making a movie. At the same time, also living with uh, the burden of more and more carrying huge, huge budgets with you, so you have also mm -hmm. to have carry that. That's kind of also a, a thing I, I have to deal with, but I'm ready to do that. Um, but I think the adrenaline of creating something right there with a lot of people, of high-class professionals, because I don't um, I avoid to do rehearsals in the beginning. I want to do it right then and there and really go for it. And uh, a lot of people want to get a little bit more the safe way and, and rehearsal and figure things out before. So on the set, then we know basically already what we want to do. I don't want to do. Yeah, I, but you did have to do that on Perfect Storm because of what the, didn't you? The technical stuff. Yeah. Technical I'm not talking about, I'm oh, talking I, more about the, the creative stuff, right. you know, scenes and dialogue and how that all works out, how it goes between the actors. Thank you for coming. Pleasure. It was a pleasure for me. Uh, one of the most talked about films of the year 2000, Perfect Storm, directed by Wolfgang Peterson. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.